Amen. Go ahead and please be seated. Uh, junior church at this time can be dismissed. If you would like your children to go downstairs with my wife, uh, and uh, she has uh, lessons for them, uh, and uh, they're going through Elijah uh, in the Bible. But uh, uh, again, if you'd uh, be willing to send them down there with her, or they're more than welcome to stay in the service today. Uh, and uh, uh, if you would, First uh, John chapter number 4, as we have been looking at uh, this passage of scripture with uh, our theme for missions for uh, the month and and first uh, John chapter four and then uh, find a second Corinthians chapter eight and we'll be there in just a moment first uh, John chapter number four first uh, John chapter four and then second Corinthians chapter eight and uh, it was a blessing the men's rally they had 15 churches represented there and uh, just a, a large group of men uh, that uh, came together for the preaching of God's word on a Friday night. And I just thank the Lord for it. It was good to see uh, some, some of the, the older men, but then also there was a lot of young men. And uh, we uh, just uh, it was exciting to see men in their 20s uh, and uh, that uh, uh, would uh, love to give up a Friday night and go and listen to the preaching. Just a good spirit and, and uh, just the... Uh, uh, the fellowship that everybody was having together, and and uh, and so uh, again, it was a a blessing. Uh, here in in First uh, John chapter four, as we begin, the Bible uh, just says here in verse number seven, it says, uh, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God." Now, everybody defines love differently, don't they? I mean, uh, sometimes you hear people all the time say, "I love you, I love you." And, uh, uh, I mean, people tell you sometimes they love you, they don't even know you. And uh, I kind of feel like uh, Thomas when, you know, uh, the Lord came to him and says, uh, Behold, an Israelite needs no, no guile. And he said, Lord, whence knowest thou me? And he's not going to get away with that flattery, but, uh, you know, to a, a love. And, and, uh, but, but God defines the kind of love he wants a Christian to have. And, and uh, the Bible says in, in verse, uh, verse uh, 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It's God's love. It's not, uh, not a love that we have naturally. Uh, it's a supernatural love that God gives us at salvation and the Holy Spirit of God gives. And uh, verse 9, and this was manifest, the love of God toward us. And so as you, you look at the definition of love, look at the illustration of love. Uh, the Bible says, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that, he might live, that we might live through him. Herein is love. Uh, this is the, the definition of love. Sometimes we, 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 we love people that love us back, but somebody doesn't like us, then, uh, you know, it gives us a new understanding of love your enemies. And if somebody doesn't like you, can you still love them? And, and uh, well, with God's love, you can. It's a supernatural love. But uh, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation uh, for our sins. Love involves sacrifice. And uh, love truly given is not based upon uh, the receiver. Uh, it's based upon the giver. And, uh, of course, God loved us. Uh, the Bible says not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation uh, for our sins. And, uh, you know, if you hear a man say, you know, there's a time he loved his wife, but he just fell out of love. Uh, well, that's not her fault. That's his fault. Uh, you know, love is not based upon the receiver. It's based upon the giver. Aren't you glad that uh, your, uh, God's love for you isn't based upon your love for him? Uh, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? And, uh, but, uh, you know, again, God, God loves us, uh, and we're unlovely, but God still loves us. And, and, uh, but, uh, again, the love, we think of missions, and, and uh, to, uh, uh, to think of, uh, again, here, here in Coquille, and, and uh, you know, living our lives, and, and, boy, we're saved, and we're on our way to heaven, and we've got a great future ahead of us, and, and uh, we're busy and carried about things, and, and why should I care uh, you know, about that, that uh, village of people uh, in the, the, the southeastern part of Alaska. I'm never even going to be there. I don't know anybody that lives there. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've never met anybody from there. And, and, uh, and so why, why, why would I care, uh, you know, uh, where they spend their eternity? I mean, uh, you know, to be able to look at, uh, as we think of, of missions, and I praise the Lord that some have a burden for missions. You know, God loves those people. And Jesus Christ, uh, he, he died for them just like he did you. And he gave his, uh, his, his life for them just like he did for you and me. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's with God's love 
uh, that we as Christians, we get excited about reaching people all over the world. And, you know, one day you're going to get to meet them, those that get saved, amen? Uh, what, a, what a blessing that's going to be in heaven, uh, you know, to get to, uh, to meet. Uh, some have asked, what are we going to do in heaven? You've got a lot of people to meet in heaven, amen? And, uh, uh, and uh, talk about the fellowship in heaven. Uh, to be able to, uh, you know, go around and, and uh, we were in that group of, of men at that men rally and, and uh, there was, uh, you know, a, a, a few men that I knew and, and uh, uh, got to just uh, re renew acquaintance. We're going to get to spend some time renewing acquaintances, but there was a lot of other men that I didn't even get to even a chance to meet. It's kind of overwhelming. So many people, you don't know anybody and, and uh, uh, you know, be able to, uh, to, to, to look at. There was a lot of, you know, uh, and so, uh, so just a few hours uh, together is not a lot, you know, but we get an eternity uh, to be able to, uh, to get to know our brothers and sisters in Christ and, and uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, talk about a family reunion. You ever been in one of those family reunions you don't know anybody? And uh, it's a little bit intimidating, isn't it? And, and uh, you know, who do I talk to? And, and uh, uh, you know, you're going to get to heaven, you're going to get, a, you know, uh, this is, uh, there's not going to be any cousins, just brothers and sisters and, uh, as, as we get there. But, uh, but God's love, here in his love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. And, uh, of course, he gave his son uh, for, for our sins. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And just going to look at the testimony of a church here, that, uh, or churches that had a, a, a testimony. Uh, they, they, they had a love for uh, people that they had never met. And uh, back in, in Jerusalem, uh, they, they, uh, uh, of course, they lived in Macedonia. And, uh, and uh, they, they had not been to Jerusalem, and, and yet there's, there's people in Jerusalem that have need. And, and, uh, and so uh, Paul comes, and he, he shares the need, and, and, uh, and he's just amazed at the outpouring of love from the church of, churches of Macedonia. And uh, as we uh, think of, uh, of missions, and, and here in, in uh, verse number 8, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit. So he's writing to the church at Corinth. He just wants to share this testimony of what he's just witnessed take place. And, and uh, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, to, uh, to have this, this uh, testimony of now that is love. And, and at verse uh, 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, and uh, he doesn't share, go into detail of all that's going, taking place in Macedonia, but it's rough times in Macedonia. Uh, and uh, uh, you think it's rough in Jerusalem at this time. It, it, it was rough in Macedonia. The Bible says uh, a great trial of affliction. Affliction enough is for me. I, I, I don't want affliction. Uh, but then to have a trial of affliction, but a great trial of affliction, uh, Paul's not, uh, you know, this is uh, given by inspiration of God. He's not exaggerating. And so it, it was really rough times in Macedonia. And the Bible says that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. Isn't it a blessing to be around joyful people? And uh, uh, you, ever, you ever hung out with somebody that's depressed? And uh, it can kind of depress you, can't it? Uh, sometimes you just need a break and get around somebody who's just really joyful, full of joy and happy. And, and, uh, but I, I just think of the joy that comes from the Lord. And, and uh, it's an eternal, internal joy, and it's not based upon circumstances. And so you get into a great trial of affliction, and you have a people that have great joy. It stands out. And, and the Bible says here the abundance of their joy, not just their joy, but the abundance of it. Uh, and, uh, and notice here he says, and their deep poverty. Uh, I've never been in poverty. Uh, I don't know what poverty is like. I've witnessed it, uh, being in the Navy and 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 traveling to a lot of a lot of places, and and uh, and then of course the uh, uh, homeless situation and such, and what it's become. And I, I I've uh, you know uh, witnessed, but I, I've never myself been in poverty. Uh, I've uh, I've never had a time that I. Uh, you know, worried about, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, something to eat or a place to sleep or, uh, you know, I, I, again, I'd have to say I, I don't know what poverty is like and I'm not asking Lord to give me uh, an understanding. But, uh, you know, to uh, look at uh, poverty, but, uh, but the Bible says that it's deep poverty. Uh, Paul's trying to make a statement here and, and just to give an understanding of the circumstances. And uh, so you've got a people under a great trial of affliction uh, and yet abundance of joy a deep poverty. And uh, 
Uh, what is a deep poverty? I, I don't know what a deep, a deep poverty without uh, anything and no, no hope of, uh, you know, but, uh, but it says here, uh, this, this, uh, this mathematical formula, you know, 2 plus 2 equals, you, th you think, uh, well, this is algebraic formula because it's, it's words, but it says uh, uh, you got a great trial of affliction plus an abundance of joy plus a deep poverty. Notice here the Bible says abounded or equals uh, the riches of their liberality, yet they were a giving people. Uh, they were a giving people. They were uh, under a deep, uh, you know, all the ingredients it says that they sh should have been the opposite. Uh, can you imagine going to uh, the uh, churches of Macedonia and Paul walks in, and he, didn't, he didn't realize what was there until he got there and he's just given a testimony, you know, and, and uh, you know, you walk in and, and, and say, yeah, uh, there, there's some people over here that, uh, you ever had problems and you met somebody with greater problems? You feel kind of guilty for even complaining, right? All those complaints you gave because they got it, uh, you know, uh, worse than you do, and, and uh, so you feel like exaggerating about your problems because, uh, you know, again, their uh, their problems so great, and, and uh, but uh, the Bible says here in, in verse number uh, three, four, to their power, their ability, in other words, what they would have to give, uh, to their power, I bear them, uh, bear record and beyond, uh, in other words, beyond their ability, uh, they were willing of themselves. And uh, we want to have a part and uh, wish we could do more. Uh, wish we could do more. And it was a sincere from their heart. Verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this they did not as we hoped, uh, and the word hoped, uh, we, we, uh, we, we say maybe, you know, it will. Uh, the word hope in the Bible means expected. You can count on it. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why faith is the, the evidence of things hoped for. Uh, we expect heaven, amen? And uh, uh, still, I believe we'll be a little surprised when we get there. I don't know. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we expect it. I mean, Jesus promised it. And, and uh, you know, hope is, is it to be expected. And the Bible just says here, uh, you know, and, and uh, this they did not as we hoped or expected. Not we, I mean, you see their deep poverty and their, uh, their abounding affliction. And, and, uh, uh, but it says, uh, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And uh, that'd be a good way to live your life. Uh, Lord, I'm yours. And uh, this life is yours. And how would you like me to use it? Uh, you know, Paul said, nevertheless, uh, I live yet. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. Amen. And uh, uh, there is, as he, he looked at, uh, he gave his life to the Lord. And that's what happened here in Macedonia, the churches of Macedonia. Uh, and, and he says churches, so it wasn't just one church. Uh, this was, uh, you know, a, a, a common trait of the churches of Macedonia. And, uh, but uh, it says they, they, they first would go and give themselves completely to the Lord and then ask God, God, what would you have me do? And uh, the Bible says here in, in uh, verse number 5, And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. I mean, it was so exciting to behold. We wanted Titus. We're sending Titus to come and share this message with you and, and uh, see if this might happen in Macedonia. I mean, in, in Corinth, what we saw happen in Macedonia. Uh, verse 6 or verse 7, it says, Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, uh, why? Because Second Corinthians, uh, Corinth was in a time of revival. Uh, they they had repented of First Corinthians, all the problems and things in the church, and and uh, uh, repentance takes place. What comes next? Revival, and, and the church in Corinth is in revival, and and he says you're abounding right now, and in all these things. It says uh, in in verse uh, verse verse number uh, seven. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us. See that you abound in this grace also. I want to see this take place at Corinth as well. Verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Verse number 9, for you know the grace, uh, the unmerited favor, the undeserved gift, uh, 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Uh, he, he left heaven. Uh, he left uh, everything that was there in heaven. He came and he, uh, he was uh, born into this world not in a wealthy family, in a wealthy place. He was born in a stall, and he was born to a carpenter's family. And, and in fact, uh, the first years of his life, what did he do? They were fleeing to Egypt and spent some time there, and then Nazareth. And, and we know what uh, the testimony of Nazareth was where he grew up. And, uh, can any good thing come from there? It was a testimony. It was a very poor uh, you know, a, a place that he, he lived and grew up. And, and, uh, and then uh, as he, he began his, his, his public ministry, he, uh, you know, he was despised and rejected and cursed and and, uh, and to, to, to look at uh, you know the, the, the I mean uh, to, to the things he went through the Bible says tempted in all points like as us yet without sin he became poor why, why did he do that uh, for you and me and then he went to that cross and he, he he took our sins upon him that's the deep poverty isn't it I don't know that's a, a type of poverty I mean sin the wickedness of sin and you think of how wicked this world has become. There's a lot of sin that Jesus died for. And he took all of those sins upon him as he went to that cross to pay the price for you and I. The Bible says, uh, for you know the grace of God. In other words, this is the basis of what I'm asking. And, and, uh, but uh, how much that he loved us. Uh, it says, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich might have heaven as your home, might have the Holy Spirit as your teacher and your guide, might have new life in Christ, your sins forgiven, uh, all the blessings that God uh, has given and, and has yet in store, uh, that we might be rich. Uh, he became poor. And as we, we think of, of missions, and uh, again, a, a burden for People like God had a burden for us. The Bible says freely, or the Bible, uh, you know, the song says freely you have received, freely give. And it comes out of a, a, a Bible verse. But, uh, but uh, freely you have received, freely give. Because of what he's done for us herein uh, is love. And uh, Brother Adams got to see him uh, Friday night and, and just talking to him. But a, a quote that, uh, you know, that he gave me uh, and uh, says, uh, now, now uh, uh, it says here, uh, nowhere does the Bible command the lost to come to church. You know, we go out and we tell them, hey, the Bible says you, you need to go to church. No, nowhere does it command the lost to go to church. Uh, but it does command the church to go to the lost. Amen? Uh, nowhere does it command the lost to go to church, but it does command the church to go to the lost. Uh, the Bible says go uh, to all, uh, go and teach all nations. Go ye into all the world and be a preacher uh, and to preach the gospel to every uh, creature. And, and uh, he says uh, there that they were to wait and the Holy Spirit come upon them. And he says, and then you're to go. What? And be witnesses unto me, uh, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. God, uh, God uh, you know, many times we, uh, we say, well, let's have church. and Maybe we can get the lost people to come and get saved. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, no, uh, you know, uh, go to church and worship the Lord and get right with God and then go out into that world and reach them with the gospel. Uh, take the gospel to them. Uh, and uh, that's the love of God that, uh, that we would, uh, and, and of course, how are they going to hear without a preacher? And so somebody's got to be sent. Uh, and uh, that's where missions comes in. Uh, and... Uh, this was encouraging to me. I, I wasn't alive, at, you know, at that time. But, uh, but uh, uh, World War II, just kind of an amazing war that was fought, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, just the uh, testimony of the United States during that. And, and of course, uh, there, there was victory that was had in, in, in World War II by the United States. But uh, just a, uh, uh, this, this article was just written about uh, times that I, I wasn't alive. But my brother Bud, he was probably here, but, uh, you know, I, I wasn't. Uh, just picking on him this morning, so because uh, he's right here in front, uh, somebody ought to sit up in front of him here. George, you want to get up here? And we alive during World War II? Uh, 
All right. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, uh, uh, here, uh, an extremely important but sometimes overlooked aspect of World War II was America's overwhelming home front effort. While many countries around the world were dealing with the destruction and chaos of war, the U.S. had many opportunities to help the Allied forces with the war being fought away from its shores. This effort is prominently represented in the World War II Memorial on the National Mall. I don't know if you've had a chance to go there and see that. We, uh, we did get to go and, and see that. But uh, it says, uh, each of the 56 memorial columns that represent the states and territories that existed during the war is decorated with two wreaths. A wreath made of wheat represents agricultural output of the uh, and, and the, the wreath of oak leaves represents industrial productivity. The two pillars of American home front effort. Additionally, uh, a number of the base uh, relief panels that line the ceremonial entrance of the memorial depict scenes from the American home front, including shipbuilding, war bonds, drives, and agricultural production. And uh, uh, why we we took care of the Allies? That's uh, you know a big part of the victory that was had, and not just the Americans, but the Allies that were uh, fighting in in the war as well. And and uh, it says uh, uh, re realizing the massive amount of food that was needed to feed the troops, farmers from across the country went into full production mode. Shipment after shipment went overseas to feed the hungry soldiers. So in demand was the food that it quickly became clear food rationing would have to take place within the United States. Never uh, once to shy away from the challenge, Americans across the country began planting victory gardens. If you've ever heard that term, victory gardens. Uh, why? All the farmers' uh, crops went to the soldiers. They went to uh, overseas to uh, fuel uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, soldiers in their fighting. And and uh, it says uh, 20 million victory gardens uh, popped up around the country, and accounted for 40 percent of the vegetables consumed within the U.S. I mean, they fed uh, you know the the people of the United States. Why? Because everything was going overseas to uh, to uh, fuel the soldiers and. Uh, 1942, the U.S. had but an extensive rationing program in place. The government began putting limits on much-needed supplies. Civilians were issued ration stamps that were used for family allotments of vegetables, fruit, meat, gas, rubber, and even clothing. Americans worked hard not to waste any essentials. So involved was the country in this effort that citizens conducted recycling drives to collect scrap metal, cans, rubber, and many other items that could be used for constructing mil military weapons, ammunition, tanks, jeeps, and ships. On the National Mall, rationing even affected the newly constructed Thomas Jefferson Memorial, de dedicated in 1943. Due to the wartime metal shortage, the central statue of Jefferson was originally cast in plaster. Uh, the current bronze version on display wasn't until 1947, of course, after the, the war was over. Uh, some scrap metal uh, drives were a popular way to collect unused and unwanted metal that could be used to build ships, airplanes, and other equipment needed to fight the war. As the war raged on, more and more men were sent overseas. Uh, this left an enormous gap in the American workforce. The gap was quickly filled by millions of women across the country who filled every position from driving tractors and trucks to building ships and uh, riveting planes. So amazing was this industrial output during the war that it stunned the rest of the world. Considered by many experts as a major contributing factor for the Allied victory, the U.S. produced 86,000 tanks, 193,000 artillery pieces, uh, bomb shells, uh, and 297,000 aircraft. Uh, a shocking two-thirds of all Allied equipment uh, came from the U.S. during the war. Uh, war bond drives were another important aspect of the U.S. home front effort. Bond rallies were a very common sight during the war, and parades were had across the country to raise money. So popular were these bond drives that 85 million Americans, over one half of the population, purchased $185 billion of bonds. That's over $2,000 per person living in the U.S. at that time. And when their average salary was $2,000 a year. This all-inclusive home front effort included great sacrifice from every American citizen. 
This patriotic effort was so instrumental in, in pulling the country together and helping win the war that it is often credited for empowering American soldiers and leaving enemies awestruck. For these reasons, the home front effort is proudly represented within the World War II Memorial. What a country. That used to be the United States of America. Uh, where is that United States of America? Uh, but uh, to, to think of, uh, you know, again, uh, pulling together. And, and so those soldiers fighting, uh, it's, it's believed they were empowered because uh, their country was behind them uh, as they went forward. And they didn't have to fear. Where are they going to get, you know, the food to eat or, uh, you know, to uh, be able to, uh, the clothes to wear or those things to take care of. They, they could concentrate on fighting the battle uh, that they were called to fight. You say, why do you share that? You know, we're in a spiritual warfare. God has called Bible Baptist Church to reach every creature. God has called Bible Baptist Church to reach every nation, uh, every place. Now, that's a big task, isn't it? Uh, God has called us to, uh, you know, to, uh, to be able to go uh, and preach the gospel to every uh, creature. And, and how do we do that? Uh, well, we must go. Amen? Uh, we need to be faithful here in Coquille. Uh, we need to be continually get the gospel out. Uh, not one time the gospel in everyone's hand, but over and over and over. How long? Uh, until they breathe their last breath, until they have their last opportunity to receive Christ as their Savior. Uh, you never know the time and place when somebody will get saved, but everyone needs to be saved. Jesus Christ is not willing that any perish. He came and he died for the, the, the souls of, uh, of everyone. And uh, uh, we can't expect our missionaries to be faithful as they go overseas if we're not going to be faithful at home. Uh, we need to go. And uh, secondly, we need to pray. Uh, we need to pray. We, we need to, uh, God, uh, prayer moves the hand of God. And, and uh, you know, as we, uh, as we uh, pray for the souls of Coke Hill and pray for the souls of, uh, and pray for our missionaries and pray for the souls of, you know, the Bible says uh, there to, to pray what that he'd send forth labors. Why, the, the, the field is wide unto harvest. Uh, I just praise the Lord. We recently read Brother Sparks' uh, letter. There's a, there's a revival taking place in the Philippines. There's many people getting saved and, uh, uh, in, in the Philippines. And, and uh, there is an openness to the gospel that we, we don't see here in America. I uh, praise the Lord for Wendy at Trust in Christ as her Savior last week. And that was so exciting. And, and I talked to David last night. I'm not sure what happened, but their family and, and, uh, and uh, his, his dad and Wendy, they were going to be here today. So she's very excited about being saved. And, you know, I praise the Lord. We don't see that often enough of people, uh, you know, getting saved and, and uh, uh, just uh, uh, to, to be able to see. But, but our missionaries do. Read the missionary letters and see the, uh, the, the fields are wide unto harvest. We, we sit in America and we say, boy, the Lord's going to come soon because people are so hard to the gospel and and there uh, you know I, I hope the Lord comes soon uh, but you can't take the temperature of America to determine that uh, because uh, the, the gospel is going out and people are being saved uh, and uh, you know there's uh, there, there are you know uh, people uh, even today that uh, you know they're trusting Christ as their savior and and there's an openness to the gospel in many countries today and and uh, but uh, again uh, you know uh, so 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 maybe it's it, it's hard in America that people are just uh, you know uh, hardened and and maybe have heard the gospel so many times or just don't care and and uh, you know we live in the land of plenty and our needs are taken care of and we don't understand deep poverty and and uh, you know many people aren't looking for the Lord they're happy where they're at and like things are and, and we give them the gospel and they turn a deaf ear and, and, uh, but uh, you know give them the gospel anyway and uh, that's, this is where God's called us uh, I like with the, you know, the one speaker that we had that came through and, and, and he says yes uh, you know, it is harder to win souls today uh, than it has been in the past that just means we've got to work harder uh, you know, many Christians take that as I'm just not going to tell the gospel much anymore because people aren't listening. No, you just got to work harder at it. Uh, when, the, when the job gets tough, you got to get tougher. And, uh, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ still is, is reaching souls uh, today. And, and, uh, but uh, as we, we think of, uh, you know, the amazing home front is the, in the, in the uh, title of that, that article. But, uh, you know, as we, we, we think of missions and uh, as a church, and I, I think of, uh, you know, American, I, I just, as Christians, where's our sacrifice? Where's, 
Uh, you know, uh, we see uh, the, the uh, burden to get the gospel out, and you have these countries open to the gospel, and, and uh, uh, th there should be a, a, a joy and a desire as Christians to uh, be a part of sending uh, somebody into those fields uh, that a harvest might be uh, reaped. And, and so as we, as we think about missions, and we've been looking about missions here for, uh, for uh, uh, this is our fourth uh, fourth Sunday and and uh, just uh, dealing with uh, again uh, uh, trying to renew that that uh, burden for missions that uh, and, and see the need and recognize that people uh, today need Christ just as much as they needed him when he came uh, and have always needed him and and uh, to be able to have a part uh, in missions and so I just want to look at uh, a few statements given here in in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and as uh, Paul is, is uh, writing to Corinth and, and trying to encourage them with the testimony of Macedonia. And, and, uh, and so and notice here, if you would, first uh, verse number four, uh, the uh, testimony of, uh, of Macedonia, the Bible says here, uh, praying us with much entreaty. Uh, you look at that word entreaty. In other words, begging us. Please. Uh, you ever had somebody try to give you... Uh, thankfulness or whatever but they try to give you a gift or try to give you money and you say no that's okay thank you uh, and so they uh, stick it in your pocket when you're not looking you get home <laughs> you know they so wanted to give you uh, entreaty please you know what what he's saying is Paul didn't want to take their offering uh, Paul Paul he realized their their great affliction he realized their deep poverty and, uh, uh, you know, you need it more than they need it in Jerusalem. Uh, and I can't take this. The Bible says praying us with much entreaty. That means begging us to take it. What? That we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. These, these, these Christians in Macedonia and these churches, they said we want to have a part in reaching Jerusalem. We want to have a part in, in being a blessing to the, uh, to the saints in Jerusalem. And, and, uh, and so uh, what do they say? We want to have fellowship. Uh, fellowship. We have fellowship, don't we? If I was to say, hey, we're going to have a fellowship after church today, what does that mean? Food! Uh, we've had a lot of picnics and potlucks this summer, haven't we? It's been a blessing. In fact, you forgot to cook. Sunday dinner today because you just expect you go to church there's going to be food well there's no food today but uh, uh, anyway uh, you know fellowship we attribute fellowship with with food uh, I, I like the definition that uh, you know I heard uh, but uh, fellowship definition two fellows in a ship rowing in the same direction two fellows in a ship rowing in the same direction uh, Webster gives a definition of fellowship uh, as uh, we think of uh, here, uh, uh, he gives the terms as uh, partnership, joint interest, partnership, joint, uh, and that's why we can have a work party and still call it a party. What we're fellowshipping, what, what does it mean? We're working together. Uh, we're, we're, we're participating. There's a joint interest. There's a partnership uh, involved. And here Macedonia says we want to be a part of what's taking place in Jerusalem. Uh, we want to be a part of uh, this uh, giving that uh, for for these saints back in Jerusalem, and and, and so uh, as we look at fellowship, uh, what uh, stands out in in, in missions uh, missions is fellowship. Uh, what a blessing to get to have a part uh, in fellowshipping with Jesus as He reaches the world. Amen. You ever thought of missions as fellowship with Jesus? Uh, it's fellowship. You want to have fellowship with Jesus. It's a joint partnership with Jesus to reach the lost. Uh, the Bible says that uh, Jesus, he, he ever, live, uh, ever liveth to make intercession for them. Who's he talking about? The lost that he's trying to save. Uh, ever liveth, day and night. He, he desires to make intercession, to, uh, to be their Savior. A burden for the lost. You're fellowshipping with Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.9, you can write it down. The Bible says, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. What's fellowship? Partnership. Joint interest. Missions is fellowship with Jesus. 
Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, and of course, uh, 28, uh, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And, and then he went to uh, say, he says, And take my yoke upon you. Uh, what a wonderful illustration. You know, a yoke, uh, the purpose of a yoke was to put two animals together for pulling, for work. It was to keep them as partnership in unity together as they pulled the plow as a yoke. What Jesus literally is saying is, and take my yoke upon you. In other words, you get in the other side over here. We're going to do this together. It's a partnership. It's fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God doesn't ask us to serve him. He asks us to serve with him. When he says, will you serve me and, and be a servant of God? He's, uh, he never asks us to do it alone. Uh, so often our faith is so little that when God asks, oh, I can't do that, the Lord is saying, well, Silly, I can. You're just on the other side. We're going to do this thing together. And that's what God desires, that we would fellowship with him. And, and so missions is a fellowship first with Jesus. Secondly, it's a fellowship with your church. That's what missions is. It's a fellowship with your church. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. God's great commission and command to reach the uttermost parts of the world, it wasn't to an individual or individuals, it's to a church. That just happened to be the early church made up of the disciples there as Jesus gave the commission as he left. And, and uh, when he said, go ye, ye is plural. He, he, he says, he didn't say, to go thou. He said, go ye. And it, it's a, a, a command to a church to go. And, and uh, all you're doing is you're just participating, partnershipping together with your church to reach the world. Uh, fellowship here in Acts chapter 2 and what was so exciting about this new church in, in, in uh, Jerusalem and, and of course the Holy Spirit had, had to come and give them the call to reach the world and, and uh, well they began reaching Jerusalem and, and here in Acts chapter number 2 and beginning in verse 42 the Bible says and they continued uh, there you get the 3,000 souls that get saved and and the work of God goes out. In verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and of prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all they that believed were together and had all things common. And it just says they continued what in fellowship. Verse 45, And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. I mean, they started to on fire reach the city of Jerusalem. Verse 46, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And Notice the result, and the Lord added to the church daily. It would be a blessing to see people get saved every day. Uh, it's a blessing to be a part of God's work. Uh, it's fellowship with Jesus. It's fellowship with your church. And then... Thirdly, it's fellowship with the missionaries. It's fellowship with the missionaries. You're taking part in their ministry. God has called them to go to a people, to reach those people. And we as a church come alongside and we say, hey, we will fellowship with you in reaching those people. Uh, and uh, we fellowship through prayer. We fellowship through encouragement. We fellowship through giving that they might do the going uh, it's fellowship with our missionaries. Uh, Galatians 2.9 says this, And when James, Cephas, and John, were, uh, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. What's he saying? They partnered together with us. and said, we'll, we'll reach the Jews in Jerusalem. You go out and reach the Gentiles. We're going to reach every creature. They partnership together with the missionaries. Paul it was, and Barnabas were missionaries sent out. Philippians 1.5, the Bible says, uh, Here for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Uh, so we think of fellowship. The church at Philippi, they, they supported Paul. Uh, they, they supported him in the ministry that he might go. And, and he just calls it fellowship. You partnered together with me. 
Missions is fellowship. Fellowship with Jesus, fellowship with your church, fellowship with the missionary. Uh, it's a partnership together to reach the uttermost parts of the world. Secondly, I'd like you to notice here, back here in, in uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and these next two be very quick on, but uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Notice verse 1, he begins out the section, just uh, speaking of uh, this, uh, this term. It says in, in verse 1 of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God. Uh, the grace. You know, a grace is, is a gift. It's unmerited, undeserved, unearned. It's something that's given without charge. Grace, you know it's a gift to be a part of missions. It's a gift to be a part of missions. If you go through this, uh, this uh, section and he's just continually mentioning the grace, look at verse 6. Insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Look at verse 7. Therefore as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. Of course, verse number nine, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the gift. Uh, you know, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, it's, it, it's a gift. Uh, I, I shared with you the, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, uh, just, just to think what God thinks of that. But there, there's some, some people that they use the term, they say they aren't missionaries, they're moochinaries. Uh, what do you mean? Well, they're going around asking churches for money so that they can go live in another country. They're moochinaries. Yeah, and, uh, you know, those that would think that, they're going to face God one day. You know, you know, missionaries are our heroes. I think of the sacrifice and the love. Uh, what, what a testimony, the surrender to God that they would take their family and they would move to another place and learn uh, a different language and live in a different culture and raise their children there uh, and leave the United States of America for a love for souls. Uh, when they come to our church, they're, they're not coming to, uh, to, to beg for money. They're, they're coming to allow us to be a partner with them as they go. It's a lot harder to go than it is to be here and stay faithful. Uh, you know, giving is the easy part of missions. That's, that's simple. You write the check and you drop it in and there it goes. And you, you skip a, you know, a Burger King meal or something. I mean, we really sacrifice for the Lord, don't we? Uh, it does cost a lot for Burger King anymore, doesn't it? But uh, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, look at, at uh, uh, you know, uh, what we give for missions. Uh, God gave his only begotten son. Uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, as uh, missionaries, they give us an opportunity to be a partner together, to fellowship together with them as they reach souls. And uh, we ought to hold them up very highly for that. Uh, to be thankful. We get to fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We get to fellowship with our church. We get to fellowship with the missionaries. It's a gift. When missionaries come, they give us the opportunity you understand one day we get to heaven and that host of souls, we've never even met them. We've never given the gospel to them. Uh, we've never specifically, personally prayed for them. We've prayed for the missionary and the missionary, the, the souls the missionary is reaching, but uh, you know, we've never met them till we get to heaven. But yet, we got to have a part in their salvation. Uh, missions is a blessing. Uh, missions is a joy. Missions is a gift. Daniel 12, 3, the Bible says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Uh, here in America, it can be tough to reach a soul. Praise the Lord for those that get saved. Amen. But at the same time, as we give to missions, and as we pray for our missionaries, and as we support and encourage them, every soul they reach Paul says, abounds to your account. Philippians, or Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. 
Philippians, the Bible's writing back to him in Philippians chapter 4, and we're not, a good passage, read, you know, uh, there my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And he's writing to the church at Philippi because he's in prison and, and, uh, and they've, uh, they've uh, sent uh, a member of their church to go and take care of the apostle Paul while he's in prison because uh, his family had forsaken him because they were strong Jewish and, and he's now Christian and, and he had nobody to take care of him while he's in prison and it's not like our prisons today. Uh, if your family didn't take care of you, you just starved and you froze and, and uh, there was no heating and uh, air conditioning and all those kinds of things. It was just a stone cell that you were in and, and, uh, uh, and no medicine or nothing. You got sick. There was no doctor in the, like we got in our jail and, and uh, come and, and uh, take care of you. And, and uh, you're diabetic. There's no diabetic medicine. You don't get any insulin or anything unless your family brings it into you. And, and Paul's need. And so the church, uh, actually a man surrendered from the church of Philippi to go there and to reach the apostle or to, to support and encourage the missionary while he was in prison and and of course he, if you read the uh, the uh, prison epistles of Paul and yeah, he, he did a lot of preaching from prison but uh, anyway just to support him while he was there and then the church gave so that uh, that uh, the the the, uh, the uh, missionary that went could help uh, support Paul while he's in prison. And, and Paul says, not that I speak in, in want. He says, I've learned to be content. God will take care of me regardless. He says, but, he says, what excites me is that uh, it's fruit abounding to your account, he tells the church at Philippi. Uh, and it, it's a gift to be a part of missions. A gift that many Christians miss out on. He says, I want you to have this grace also, along with everything else. Uh, this gift, what, to, to partner together with the Lord Jesus Christ and with your church and with a missionary to reach the uttermost parts of the world. And then number three, and, and again, there's, there's so much more here, but uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, and, and uh, if you would, the Bible just says here uh, in uh, verse number 8, I speak not by commandment. He says, I'm just coming to the, the occasion, I said, the testimony, the, this is by the occasion, the forwardness of what, what happened in churches of Macedonia. It says, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Uh, missions gives you an opportunity to prove the sincerity of your love. Uh, practice the love of God that shed abroad on your heart through the Holy Ghost. Uh, it proves the sincerity. What does it mean by to prove the sincerity of your love? It gives you an opportunity to demonstrate love. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to demonstrate love for people that one day you're going to meet in heaven. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to demonstrate your love for the lost, certainly for the missionary, but most importantly, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we give to missions uh, why? Because he gave all for us. And how can we not turn around and give for others? Herein is love. That's been our theme uh, through the missions. Herein is love. Not that we loved him, but that he first loved us. Uh, if you're not saved today, Jesus loves you. You know, the Bible says is rejoicing in the presence of the angels in heaven over one sinner that repents. That's how excited Jesus is to save you. Regardless of your sin, regardless of what you have done in your life, Jesus Christ, he came and he died for all sin. Uh, you could have even been an atheist up to this point. You could have even cursed God. You could have, uh, you know, uh, uh, you could have been like the apostle Paul was before he got saved. You could have hated Christians. You could have, uh, you know, uh, been a persecutor of Christians, and and uh, uh, he'd still save you, and he'd still be excited about saving you. And uh, there still would be rejoicing. Uh, not just Jesus uh, is in the presence of the angels in heaven, and God the Father. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, the believers, uh, there might be some in your family that would rejoice in heaven if you get saved today. Uh, and uh, uh, do you, can you still pray in heaven? You can. Uh, you just get to face to face, amen? Is that going to be something? Uh, you know, and, and maybe I'll concentrate more on prayer when I'm in heaven. I don't know. But, uh, you know, you, you think your loved ones are praying for you? They are. Now they love you with even more love. 
than they did when they were here. And uh, they'd rejoice today in heaven. Uh, just imagine the announcement to go out in heaven as a soul gets saved. And uh, there's going to be many there that will recognize that name. And rejoicing will break out. Uh, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Uh, you could be saved today. If, uh, if you are saved, uh, the love of God has been shredded abroad in our hearts. And God defines that love. Uh, loving those that you don't even know. They don't love you. They don't care anything about you. Uh, you're probably not even a thought in their day. But you know, one of those missionaries we support is going to approach them today and it's going to give them the gospel. And uh, they get saved and they start going to church and I'm sure that missionary is going to share. You know, there's a, a church, but you know our missionaries say they pray for Bible Baptist Church. We support them, they pray for Bible Baptist Church and, and share, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's some churches back in the United States that cared enough about you that they gave so that I could come and share the gospel with you. And one day, uh, it'd be neat to have that missionary walk up with that person in their hand and say, hey, I want to introduce you to, uh, you know, because you gave, uh, they got saved. Uh, be a part of missions. Uh, it's, uh, we, we, we waste a lot of our time. We waste a lot of our uh, money. We waste a lot of our resources. And, and uh, uh, this is an opportunity to do something good with, what God gives you. Let's stand as we have the invitation this morning. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for uh, this, uh, just taking four weeks out to uh, be able to, uh, four messages, just to face missions, and uh, Lord, just to renew our uh, love for missions and for uh, missionaries, and, and uh, Lord, just think of the, uh, the mission that you came upon. Uh, you are the greatest missionary as you left heaven to come to this this place and what a sacrifice to be able to come and reach souls and give the ultimate with uh, your life and and uh, taking our sins upon you and uh, Lord we uh, I don't know if we'll ever understand fully the sacrifice uh, that you made in love for us uh, but Father that we could be a part in fellowship together with you in reaching the world uh, I pray Lord that uh, we would get an opportunity to demonstrate uh, your love uh, through our lives as we uh, love those who uh, are on the, uttermost, uh, on the uh, other side of the world. Father, again, I just ask that you would bless the invitation time. And if there's one soul here not saved, uh, today they'd come to trust you as their Savior. Bless the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.